Welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. I'm Tony Guerra, the pharmacist and author of the Memorizing Pharmacology book series, bringing you mnemonics, cases, and advice for succeeding in pharmacology. Sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your free suffixes cheat sheet or find our mobile-friendly, self-paced online pharmacology review course at residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash mobile. Let's get started with the show. Okay, here I wanted to go over a little bit about asthma and COPD and kind of take it from a level where we can kind of get the big picture here. So first thing, asthma, this is that episodic bronchoconstriction and inflammation where sometimes the smooth muscle tightens up and uh, you get this inflammation that makes it you know, a narrowed airway. And then certainly during an asthma attack, that narrowing increases. Where COPD is more about, you're going to hear these two terms, uh, chronic bronchitis, which is inflammation and excess mu- mucus, and then emphysema, where the alveolar membranes are breaking down. It's down here in the bottom left of the, the graphic. Okay. So let's talk about how drugs work on the bronchiole and the receptors. And if you keep this kind of tripod together, I think it makes it a lot easier. So on the left-hand side, we have beta-2 agonism. These open up the bronchioles. Okay, so you might hear again, adrenergic agonism. It just means adrene, which is your adrenal gland. uh, That is ad on top in Latin, ren of the kidney or renal. Uh, On the right-hand side, we have muscarinic, which was referring to the mushroom or cholinergic antagonism. You might also see these as anticholinergics or anti-muscarinics. So these open up the bronchioles. So just be clear, we have two completely different mechanisms. We have adrenergic agonism versus the cholinergic antagonism, but both of them do the same thing. They both open up the bronchioles, relax the bronchioles. And then in the middle, we kind of have these inhaled corticosteroids, ICS, Uh, which reduce inflammation. But that's what asthma is. It's these two pieces where you've got bronchi that are constricting and there is inflammation involved. So here is the acronym MADNESS. A SABA is a short-acting beta-2 agonist. A LABA is a long-acting beta-2 agonist. An ultra-LABA is an ultra-long-acting beta-2 agonist. And what basically happened was is that we've got the rescue inhaler, which works quickly. Then you've got the long acting, which was working half the day. You'd have to use it twice a day. And then the ultra long acting are the ones that would last all day. Then the SAMA, which is a short acting muscarinic antagonist. It's an anticholinergic. The long acting (laughs) muscarinic antagonist, the LAMA. And then you have ICS, the inhaled corticosteroid. But this is the picture you want to have in your head when you're talking about treatment. As we treat asthma, as it gets worse, we start with the inhaled corticosteroid, then go to a long-acting bronchodilating or beta-2 agonist, and then maybe a long-acting muscarinic agonist, antagonist. COPD side, we go the other way. We go from the muscarinic to the beta two to the steroid. So if you can keep those two kind of opposite arrows in mind when you're thinking about asthma and COPD, uh, I think it'll go a long way. And then all our, both conditions, we have a SABA. So what we wanna do is we wanna convert these acronyms into actual drugs. So SABAs, albuterol, levalbuterol, LABA, salmeterol, formoterol, Ultralaba, indacatrol, and valanterol, then the SAMA, ipotropium, teotropium, aclidinium, eumeclidinium, and then the ICS, fluticasone, mometasone, beclomethasone. There are more, uh, but I just didn't want to overwhelm you. So the first thing we do is we look at the stems and the suffixes here. So the SABA, albuterol, levalbuterol, and in terol. The labas end in terol, and the ultralabas end in terol. Well, that'll be a problem, we'll see. But the samas and the lamas end in either tropium or clidinium. But you could just look at the IUM as something that's in common with both of them. And then we see the sone from fluticasone, mometasone, and beclomethasone. So maybe a little bit better to look at it this way, where 
The beta agonist is the terol. Sama is tropium or clidinium. And then the ICS is sown. But be careful because it tells you what it is, but it doesn't tell you how long acting it is. Okay. So when we put this into our arrows, we can say that, okay, if I'm going to have a muscarinic antagonist, that's going to be the IUM. The beta-2 agonist is the terol, and the corticosteroid is the sone. The sabas are going to be those, you know, still end with terols, the albuterol and levalbuterol. Okay. And you might have said, oh, he messed up at the bottom. He underlined terol, but also albuterol. I was just trying to show you that levalbuterol and albuterol are basically the same thing, but both would have the terol stem. So again, if you can put the drugs in here in this way, then it makes it a lot easier to figure out, okay, well, what am I dealing with? And you've got these kind of the big three, which are the muscarinic antagonist, the beta-2 agonist, and the corticosteroid. Okay. All right, well, let's uh, try one. So this is a drug that actually has all three in it. You've got Trelegy ellipta. So identify the LABA, the LAMA, and the ICS. Okay, and so what we do is we underline our endings, the fluticasone, umaclidinium, and then volanterol. Then we can put it into our arrows. So the cladinium is over here in the log-acting muscarinic antagonist. The volanterol is in the middle with the long-acting beta-2 agonist. And then the ICS is the inhaled corticosteroid, fluticasone. Okay, and we still keep our SABA, you know, the albuterol, levalbuterol, as our rescue inhaler. So let's look at, you know, using our eye match mnemonic where we say, okay, well, what is the indication, mechanism, adverse effects, contraindications, and uh, some of the considerations. So short-acting beta-2 agonist for asthma and COPD, that's what the indication is, and really as a rescue inhaler, okay, but it is not meant as a controller, and some people that can't afford the controllers may use it in that way, uh, and that would lead to some of the you know, adverse effects, the anxiety, the insomnia, nausea, tachycardia, tremors. There's more, but you got to get the picture that there's a jitteriness that, that comes from them. Uh, coronary artery disease, certainly uh, a consideration. And then um, really want to avoid NSAIDs like ibuprofen and naproxen. Uh, make sure that there's a minute between the puffs. Uh, don't just, you know, puff, puff. You want to give it a minute, let the you know, lungs open up, then you use the next one. It is a rescue inhaler, and these are the ones we would use before the controllers so that we're going to get a little bit more of the controller in the lungs. Okay. And you've got the LABAs, so from motorol, salmeterol, long-acting beta-2, but we're going to see it's very similar. Same adverse effects, same contraindications. Uh, avoid NSAIDs like ibuprofen. We'll use these after the rescue inhaler. Okay. But this is the big thing, and they're going to be in combination. Um, they're not to be used alone. There was a study that showed that when you use these alone, the outcomes are actually worse. So although you're seeing them alone, they're actually in combination. I didn't want to put the combinations in here because there's like 30 of them. So it just gets absolutely overwhelming. Okay. Uh, Ipratropium. So here we have... Again, COPD and asthma, anticholinergic, anti-muscarinic. Um, if you hadn't seen the BudCat video for anticholinergic effects, it's blurry vision, urinary retention, dry mouth, constipation, anhydrosis, and tachycardia. For ipratropium, when you're talking about something like this, you're really talking about that dry mouth, the constipation, and the tachycardia. Those three are the ones that you would probably see the most. Uh, then considerations, glaucoma, bladder bowel obstruction, certainly. And then uh, you want to, because you don't want to cause constipation when somebody already has an uh, obstructive bowel. And you, again, want to use this before the steroid, but it is not a rescue inhaler. I'll tell you a little bit about it um, when I refer to my, my daughters as they'd uh, gotten out of the hospital. They were preemies. Okay, so 
this albuterol and ipratropium can be used in combination. You'll see them in these nebules that have them both together. And you would just put them in this little cup and either the child would put this in their mouth or you would put it near them and they would inhale it. But a combination Saba Laba as a beta-2 agonist and anticholinergic allows you to get lower doses of both, but to get uh, that great uh, bronchial relaxation that they need. Okay. So the next piece here are the ICS. Again, we generally, we can see these in combination or alone. Uh, but be careful, this fluticasone, uh, you might see it over the counter as a nasal inhaler for allergies, as Flonase, or you might see it behind the counter as a prescription for asthma, which is Flovent. So Vent is for asthma and COPD, Nace is for allergic rhinitis. Uh, then Beclomethasone, uh, also <clears throat> QVAR. So the indications, asthma, COPD, it's, these are steroids, they reduce inflammation, but they do it locally. And that's a big deal because now we're getting fewer systemic effects. Uh, thrush, uh, which is candidiasis, and then hoarseness, which is dysphonia. Uh, these are common if you don't rinse your mouth out. So because we're using a steroid, we are locally reducing the, you know, or immunosuppressing, uh, just like prednisone will be used as an immunosuppressant for you know, transplant. Uh, we can get this very localized uh, immunosuppression. And then, so make sure the, the patient knows to, to rinse their mouth out. And I just wanted to be clear about the devices. The nebulizer like this is kind of what we had where <clears throat> we got that nebula out and they could either put their mouth on it or just kind of get into the mist there. And then the spacer is for those that can't do it themselves. Uh, I'm not talking about veterinary medicine, but it just kind of makes it, you know, if you've got a cat, um, something like that, it's obviously not going to be able to use an inhaler normally. And so what happens is that it goes into this chamber and it can just allow the cat to breathe. And there's a little flap in here that tells you that the cat is taking breaths. Uh, so it's kind of a neat device, but nebulizers uh, versus spacers. As always, this is for informational purposes only. It's not medical advice. If you've got a medical problem, consult a medical professional. Thanks for listening to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. You can find episodes, cheat sheets, and more at memorizingpharm.com. Again, you can sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your free suffixes cheat sheet or find our mobile-friendly, self-paced online pharmacology review course at residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash mobile. Thanks again for listening.